with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11. God's word comes to us to the end of chapter 11, verses 27 to 33. If I could kindly ask everyone to please stand to give your undivided attention and your reverent hearts to the Lord who speaks to us through his word and by the power of his spirit here this morning. Mark chapter 11, verses 27 to 33. This is the very word of our Lord. And they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. And they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things, or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question, Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. This is the very word of our Lord. Please be seated at this time. About 10 years ago, when as a lay person, I was serving in youth ministry at my then church over in New Jersey on the East Coast. I remember on a very typical Sunday, on a very typical Lord's Day, a very typical week, that I was hanging out with some of the youth students as well as some of the Sunday school children out in the lawn in front of the church building. We were just messing around and playing around for a bit. And I saw this one six-year-old boy who I knew for quite some time who was very athletic but a bit rowdy, and he got a little too rowdy, and so he started hitting the other children as he was wrestling around. And as it slowly escalated to a point where I felt that as an adult I should step in, I went up to this boy and I said, hey, you need to stop doing that because you got to play nicely. You have to be gentle when you wrestle and you hit other people. You have to be delicate when you hit other people. And then he responded and said, you can't tell me what to do. And I said, well, I can't because I'm an adult, and so I'm just telling you, don't do this or you're going to get in trouble. And then with all this anger, he just responded to me and said, you can't tell me what to do. And so out of my sinful anger, my sinful anger, at the age of around 25, I took this six-year-old boy, I picked him up, I walked over about 10 yards to this garbage can that was empty, I dropped him in the garbage can, and I just walked away out of my anger. By the way, we're looking for Sunday school teachers, if you're interested. <laughs> the point there is not to confess my sin, but the point there is to be honest here this morning. Let's be honest here this morning. No one likes to be told what to do. That boy captured, in some sense, really the heart of all humanity, that we don't really like to be told what to do. Everyone, in other words, has a problem with authority. Everyone has, to some degree, in some form or fashion, a problem with authority. And more specifically, we have a problem as Christians with God's authority oftentimes, with Jesus' authority, because we don't like to be told what to do. So we reject his authority. We neglect it. We discount it. You fail to appropriate it in the decisions of your life. And one of the points that I hope we'll be able to see in this passage here this morning, one of the points that I hope we'll be able to see is that when you discount or neglect or reject God's authority, that's at the moment where you realize it or not that life seems to go awry. Because if you're not listening to the Redeemer and the Creator of this world, that's when life, in some sense, will get more frustrating, where life gets a little bit more difficult, a little bit more chaotic, a little bit more confusing because you're not turning to the one who has authority over your life because we have a problem with authority. And so the issue here is authority, and it's an important one. And today's passage is exactly about that. It's about Jesus' authority over your life. What is it, and how, and why are we supposed to follow and submit in the entirety of our lives to the authority of Jesus Christ for us here this morning? And so as we look at this passage and as these verses, there's a simple flow of conversation between Jesus and these religious leaders that they call the Sanhedrin. There's a conversation here. And I just want to run through the passage, and I want to just go through the passage in this discourse, this dialogue. And what I do, we see that the main point of Jesus' authority can be seen from three perspectives, or three points as we flow through this passage. First, first we'll see that Jesus has authority. He has authority over your lives. He has a right to tell you what to do. And then secondly, we see that his authority is challenged by the religious, religious leaders of the day. So he has authority, but it's being challenged by those that we call the Sanhedrin. 
And then lastly, point three, we'll see that Jesus answers this challenge. No, he gets challenged and he answers it in his usual witty and sort of clever way. And so that's where we're headed here this morning, that Jesus has authority, is being challenged, and then lastly, Jesus answers that challenge in a way that's unsurpassing. So first point, Jesus has authority. If you thought about all that you've seen in the Gospel of Mark and Jesus, if you thought about Jesus' person and work and everything that he's taught and that he's demonstrated in his life, what is the one attribute or characteristic that stands out the most for you? Now, if you just take a moment and think about it, if you could see the life of Jesus on TV, what do you think the one characteristic of Jesus would stand out the most to you? Now, some of you may say kindness, or others may say teaching or his wit, perhaps his humor or his ability to heal, his ability to forgive sins. And all of those are, are certainly worthy in mentioning, and it's quite impressive. But on one level, all those characteristics can be subsumed under Jesus' authority. That's what's preeminent. That's what stands out. So that when you read the Gospel of Mark, the one takeaway, the impression that you get from Jesus is that he has an authority like no other. It's preeminent, it's consummate, it's climactic, it's full. That's Jesus' authority. And as one commentator, James Edwards, says, he writes this, and I quote, The characteristic of Jesus that left the most lasting impression on his followers and caused the greatest offense to his opponents was his exousia. That's the Greek word for authority. More specifically, his sovereign freedom and magisterial authority. He's saying the one thing that left his followers and offended his opponents the most was Jesus' authority. Now, what's authority when you think about it? What's your understanding or definition of authority? This is how I understand it as the way Mark uses it. Authority is essentially the right to control and command. In other words, what qualifies you to control and to command? Absolute power. Another way to think about it is those credentials that you have that allow you to control and have power. That's what authority is. It's a, it's a question of credentials. In other words, what qualifies you to say and do what you say and do? That's really the issue here when we talk about Jesus' authority. What are his credentials? Why does he have the right to control and do and command as he does? And Jesus has his complete and ultimate authority. If you turn to the end of the Gospel of Matthew, this is what he writes before Jesus gives the Great Commission. This is what he says. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. It's complete and consummate. There's no qualifications here. It says all authority. Who has all authority in heaven and on earth? Who has it been given to? Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus proclaims about himself. And you think, wow, he's so arrogant or he's so, you know, he's just so full of himself. But He's really not. He's just stating a fact in light of his resurrection that all authority has been given to him. And if you look at the Gospel of Mark, it's true. We've seen his authority throughout the Gospel of Mark. He has authority over the spiritual realm, as you see, as he casts out demons in Mark chapter 5. We see that he has authority over the natural realm as he calms the storm and the sea in the beginning and end of Mark chapter 4. He has authority over the teaching and intellectual realm as he teaches in the synagogue as we see in Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 22, and this is what it says. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority in the intellectual and teaching realm, not as the scribes. Jesus even has authority that only God seems to claim for himself in the Old Testament, as we see in Mark 2, when he heals the paralytic. Now, you know the story, you remember it, Jesus, he's teaching in his house, and all these people start gathering around him because he's becoming popular, and as he's teaching, he realizes that his fame is growing, and then you see that these four men who bring their friend who's a paralytic, they want to bring his friend to Jesus to be healed, they want to bring him so Jesus could touch him with his healing power, but because there's so many people there, they're not able to get through, so what do they do? Well, you remember the story, they go up onto the roof, they make an opening, and they slowly drop this paralytic down before Jesus in order to be healed. But what does Jesus do? He looks at them, and the verse and the passage in chapter 2 tells us, Jesus looked at the faith of the four friends, and he says to the paralytic, my son, your sins are forgiven. And in order to prove his point, he says in verse 10, but that you may know, see, that's what he says, but that you may know, that you may understand, that you may perceive, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth, 
to forgive sins. He says to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. You know, it's a remarkable scene. It's not too hard for Jesus to do this. He forgives him, and in order to prove that he has the authority to do this, he says, okay, now come up, pick up your bed, and I'll show everyone that I have this authority, pick up your bed, and take it up, and, and go home. Because he does this so that we may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. See, the first point is simple, as we've seen in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus' authority is consummate, it's complete, it's ultimate. That's a fact that we just see in the Bible itself in these passages. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus Christ. And now in our passage for the first time in the temple, the most authoritative place for the Jewish religion, and before the Sanhedrin, the most authoritative governing body in the Jewish religion, in this context, Jesus begins to show where and why he has this authority to do what he does and to say what he does. That's where we're headed. He has authority. And brothers and sisters, this is what it means for you here this morning to consider. This is the point that I'm trying to make in the first point. All decisions that you have in your life need to be subsumed under the authority of Christ. Every decision, take every captive, every thought captive by Christ is the way the Apostle Paul puts it. All decisions need to be subsumed. Your decisions about relationship, conflict resolution, marriage, the way that you spend your money, the paradigm in which you educate and teach your children, all of that in the way that you decide and live your life need to be subsumed under one, under the one who has authority and the right to tell you how to live. You have a problem with authority? We well, probably have to join the club. But Jesus is still saying, I have the right to tell you how you ought to live. And so the religious leaders, they understand this to some degree, I think, and so they're offended and they're, they're challenging Jesus in point two. This, he, they, they challenge Jesus' authority. I mean, look at verse 27. It sets the tone of the passage. You know, you can imagine for yourself at this moment that Jesus does all this. He claims authority. The, the Pharisees and the, the scribes and the, you know, the chief priests, they come to him, the elders, and they come to him in verse 27. You know, Jesus just walking in the temple, He's walking on the precincts of the temple, probably in the outer courts of the Gentile. We're told that the chief priests and the scribes and the elders approached him to ask a question. Now, these three groups, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders, compose what they call the Sanhedrin. That's just a fancy word for this governing body of religious matters. It's this governing body that was, in some sense, the top governing body in religious faith for the Jews. They were the movers and the shakers. They're the ones that had all the power. They had, in some sense, almost complete freedom in all matters religious. And they had, in some sense, a relationship in politics because that's the way that politics works. You want to make everyone happy. So they had all power, almost, in religious matters, and they had a little bit of power in politics. These were the movers and shakers. And the fact that the Sanhedrin, these important religious elite, they come to Jesus, tells us that Jesus' authority was so great at this point that it even reached the height of the religious elite. He didn't come to them. They're coming to him. They're approaching him in the temple. It's reaching the height of Jewish establishment. The religious leaders were concerned, even perhaps threatened. And so they asked their question in verse 28, and this is what they say, and we're going to harbor on this question for a little bit. They asked a question to Jesus, by what authority, what authority, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who, who gave you this authority to do them? By what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them. These things is most likely referring to Jesus and what he did in the temple. You remember flipping over the tables, turning over the chairs, driving out the herds. It also may refer indirectly to what Jesus did and said in his ministry. But they're asking him, by what authority are you doing this or who gave you this authority to do them? They're essentially asking Jesus the same thing that boy asked me 10 years ago. Who do you think you are? They're really asking the same question here. What gives you the right to do all this? You can't tell me what to do. In other words, friends, what he's asking, what the Sanhedrin is asking of Jesus is for his credentials. What sort of training or education does he have? And what are his certifications? He's asking for the credentials. Where did he go to school? Where did he get trained? What degrees or certifications have you accomplished and achieved? Now, I, I remember in some sense, when, when I was a, in a meeting back when I was working in the corporate world, it was a big meeting, had all these like, big top bosses and managing directors, so on and so forth, and all of a sudden, this young kid who looked very young and very green, fresh, fresh out of college, it seemed like, comes into this meeting, and all of a sudden, he just starts talking. He, he sort of took control of the meeting. 
And even these 50, even 55-year-old managing directors and these movers and shakers would ask all their questions and direct it to this young kid. And I thought in myself, this kid who seems very confident, maybe borderline, even arrogant, I was thinking to myself, who in the world is this kid? Now, who does this kid really think he is? Why is everyone asking him all these questions? What are his credentials? Until later on, I found out that he literally was a genius and that he graduated from these top schools. He had the most, uh, the cleanest expertise and quantitative skills, but he had the credentials. And the point that I'm trying to make is that all of life works like that in some sense. You know, the Pharisees and the elders are coming and asking for Jesus' credentials, and that's how, we, that's how we operate too in the everyday decisions of our lives. If you go to the doctor, I want to see credentials. I want to make sure that the doctor went to medical school and has an MD. You know, if I ever take my daughter to dance lessons, I'm not going to take them to take her to someone like me. I want to make sure the teacher went to dance school and has you know, some sort of certification and knows how to dance. You know, if I want someone to handle my 401k and figure out my retirement plan, I pray and hope that the financial advisor has some sort of credentials, a series 7 and 63, that he knows what he's talking about. And if someone doesn't have any credentials or certifications, the next best thing is that I pray or hope that this person would be associated with somebody who does have credentials. So if you don't have it yourself, then sometimes you say, well, if this person is associated with somebody who has authority and credentials, that oftentimes is just as good as well. So even as a child, I remember over and over again, I would tell my brother, and I would say, I would tell my brother, Francis, his name was Francis, Francis, uh, it's time to have dinner. Can you, can you come down? Can you come down for dinner? And then he would just ignore me and continually go on and do whatever he did. But when I went up and I would tell my brother, Francis, mom said you have to come down for dinner, his response was a little bit different. Well, why? Because I didn't have any credentials or authority first, but then when I came with the authority of the parent, it elicits a different response. And that's the sort of way that life sort of works. And the religious leaders, when they come here and they're asking for Jesus' credentials, what school did you go to? What training do you have? That's essentially what they're asking. What training did you come from? What schools did you get trained in? If you're not trained or have any certifications, then who gave you this authority to do what you've done? Look at the question. That's the way that it's structured. By what authority? What schooling? What credentials? What authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do it? That's their, that's their problem. That's their conundrum. And Jesus will answer them in our third point. But before we get there, I want us to settle here for a moment. I'm going to spend most of our time on this second point, but I want us to consider here for a second and ask ourselves a question, this question that's very practical. Why were the religious leaders so upset with Jesus? Now, why did they have such a problem with his authority? Now, why couldn't, he just, why couldn't they appreciate him and just embrace him? And the point is this, because if you can answer that question as to why the religious leaders have such a problem with Jesus, it'll get at the heart possibly as to why you have a problem with Jesus' authority as well. In other words, if you could answer the question and see in this passage, why does the Sanhedrin have a problem with Jesus' authority? Humanity, in some sense, is the same, and you may have a window into why you also have a problem with Jesus' authority. It may reveal why you have a difficulty acknowledging and following the authority of Jesus in your lives. And so when we look at this, we know that the religious leaders, these men who are questioning Jesus, are credential-focused. They have a vested interest in this system and maintaining the credential system in the Jewish religion because if they can maintain this system, it means that they can maintain control. It means that they would be able to maintain status and power. They had almost complete religious power. They had some political power. You know, it's a nice place to be if you're ever in a position of power. Can you imagine? Everyone respected you. Every time you walked into a public place, people would open up a pathway for you to walk. They would greet you. They would give you the best seats in the house. They would turn to you for questions. You can make decisions that affect thousands of people. It's a nice place to be. So they were credential based. They wanted to maintain the system. That's the reason why they had such a problem with Jesus' authority. That's why they probably were threatened by Jesus, because it meant to them a loss of power over their lives. It meant a loss of control, a loss of status. If someone came in and taught on a higher authority, if someone could come in and cleanse the temple on a higher authority and cast out demons on a higher authority, then it meant for this religious elite a loss of power for those who are in a position of control. It was a loss of control. And that's why, brothers and sisters, New Life Church, if you really dig deep into your lives, the reason you have such a problem with Jesus' authority is because when you look hard at yourselves, the reason we fail to acknowledge and live by Jesus' authority 
is because it's a step away from autonomy. It means it's a step away from having power and control over your lives. It means that in some sense, you can't decide what's best for you. It means in some sense, you can't just decide and make decisions according to your own will and conscience. It means that in some sense, you lose control over your lives. And for many of us, that's frustrating or unpractical. Or for many of us, that's just very difficult. We want to we wanna be as the poet William Henley has written in his poem Invictus, we want to be the masters of our fate and the captains of our souls. Now I quoted this poem before, and you know, honestly, if there's a, a, an opportunity or a relevance to the passage, I'm gonna quote it again because there's something so captivating and so alluring about this poem that's even antithetical to Christian thinking. You know, the poem is written by someone who didn't believe in God, but there's, some, there's still something alluring about the way he writes this poem, especially in the fourth stanza, because it's contrary to the Bible, but there's something that still resonates with human sin, in which he says, it matters not how straight the gates, and not how charged with punishments the scrolls. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. That's the way that many of us in our sin like to think and operate. That's the way the religious leaders were trying to operate. It resonates with us, doesn't it? We think we're in control, we can gain all the status and power, we want to make decisions to make ourselves happy. And the point I said in the beginning is that if you think like this, it's a dangerous way to go. If you think you're the master of your fate or the captain of your soul, that's a gateway to when your life will begin to crumble in on itself. Because you were never meant to be the master of your fate and the captain of your soul. You were, look, you were created to look to Jesus Christ. And for the disciples of Christ, Jesus doesn't allow that. He won't allow it. And so he'll interfere and he'll meddle with your life. Did you realize that one of the points that Jesus came into this life is to meddle into your life, to interfere with your life? You now, C.S. Lewis wrote in his in his, one of his letters, Surprised by Joy, and he says that one of the reasons and purposes of Jesus Christ coming into the world is to interfere with your life because he knows that it's better for you. C.S. Lewis calls him the transcendental interfere, transcendental, otherworldly, transcendental as the one who is spiritual and who is otherworldly, who is godly, so to speak. And Jesus, he's the transcendental, this perfect interferer because he knows that you're not created to be the master of your fate and the captain of your soul. You're created to look to the master of your life and the captain of your soul, the transcendental interferer. And that's why Lewis goes on to say, and he really captures this very clearly, and he says that at the center of what it means to be a Christian was the call to complete surrender and obedience to Christ. The center of what it means to be a Christian is a call for complete surrender and obedience to Christ. But nothing in this world is really yours, so why are you trying so hard to hold on to these things? He goes on and explains that true Christian discipleship is first a matter of the heart, the inner life, the recognition and acceptance and surrender to God's absolute authority over all the affairs of one's life in a way that leaves no place to which one may call one's own. See, the difficulty in this life as to why we have a problem with Jesus' authority is not only because we want to make decisions and maintain control, but part of that control means that in this world, we exert all our efforts and energy to try to hold on to keep those things that are temporal and fading away. When in Christ Jesus, we have those things that are eternal of everlasting significance. So the challenge here in point number two is to ask yourself, what are you exerting all your effort at the end of the day? And all, what are you striving for with all your might and all your thinking? Is it really to hold on to those things which are really temporal in this life? Or in some sense, do you have a perspective to realize that Christ as a transcendental interferer is the one who's trying to capture you and lead you on to the path of eternity? That's the problem that the Pharisees and the religious leaders had. That's the challenge they bring to Jesus. And lastly, Jesus answers this challenge. This is what he says. He answers them in a way that Jewish rabbis often do. He answers their challenge in terms of what authority he has by posing a counter question. Now, can you picture the scene for a second? Now, this is how I imagine the scene based upon the text. You know, the religious leaders, you know, they just come up and they, they ask a question very antagonistically. They say, you know, by what authority do you do these things? Or who gave you authority to do this? 
And Jesus' response is, says, I have one question for you. If you answer this, I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. Was John's baptism, was John's baptism from heaven or from man? He answers the question with a question. And so you can imagine this scene, and so these knuckleheads, like I like to call them, these religious leaders, you know, they, they go, wait, okay, give me a second. And they come here, and they gather together, and they, they discuss among themselves, as what the verse tells us. And I can imagine this group of men discussing this and then trying to answer Jesus' question. And one guy says, well, we can't say that John's baptism is from heaven, because then Jesus is going to ask us, why didn't we believe in him? And then another guy could speak up and said, well, we can't say that his baptism was from man, because everyone believed John to be a true man of God and a prophet. And if we say it was from man, we're going to lose all this cloud and we'll lose all credibility in the eyes of the people. Our popularity will be gone. And maybe even a third, a third religious leader will say, well, why don't we just say this to Jesus? Just tell him we don't know. We don't know. And so they think together and they come back to Jesus and they, they interact and they say, we don't know. It was a flat out lie. See, it's a very sad scene here. The problem is not that they didn't know. The problem is that they were unwilling to know. They were unwilling to commit themselves to the truth of Jesus Christ and to follow him. G.K. Chesterton once wrote this about the Christian faith, and he says this, and I quote, The Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. What is he saying here? He's saying it's not the fact that we could challenge Christianity and to give it a shot and we say, well, it's lacking, it's wanting, but rather when we understand Christianity and the sacrifice of being a disciple, it's found too hard and not even tried. That's the Pharisees. That's the religious leaders, the elders. They come out with this, we don't know, but they're not willing to know. They're not willing to try. They're not willing to commit themselves to the truth and the honor of Jesus Christ. These men found it difficult to allow themselves to become someone else's possession. That is, someone else who is the one who had both power and the right to hold them accountable to complete and absolute submission. The transcendental interferer. The leaders were asking Jesus for his credentials, and Jesus is telling them. He's opening up the window for the first time and explaining to them where he gets his authority. It's not from a rabbinic school of Hillel or Shammai. It's not from the Torah or the temple. It's from nothing less than God himself. Jesus' authority is God's authority. That's what his question gets at. Is John's baptism from heaven, or is it from man? Of course it's from heaven. That's what we see at John's baptism with Jesus back in Mark chapter 1. You remember the story, don't you? John baptized Jesus at the River Jordan. The heavens opened up. In some sense, it's a very violent word. It's, you know, it's split open. God is a God of, of, of righteousness, a God of judgment. He's a God of power. The heavens split open. There's a schism, and a voice from heaven declares of Jesus, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Where is Jesus' credentials? What are his authority? His credentials are not earthly, is what he's trying to get out. It's not from this world. It's not from a school. It's not from a certification. His authority is from nothing less from heaven. It's not earthly, it's heavenly. It's not worldly, it's divine. That's what Jesus is trying to get. His credentials are not from men who rebelled against him, but from God, who is the father of him. It's the highest authority that you can ever imagine. It's an authority that, in other words, is not of this world. It's from another world, namely the very kingdom in heaven. That's why they can't grasp it. That's why they can't identify it. That's why they can't discern it, because it's from a world that is not of this earth. The baptism of Jesus was the event that officially inaugurated this authority of Christ to tell you what you do, because it's better for you. He has the right and qualifications to tell you how you ought to live your life because his authority is not of this world. By what authority does Jesus do these things? By the authority and approval of a heavenly father that declares him to be his beloved son. Who gave Jesus this authority? Nothing less than God the Father, the creator of this world. God's authority is Jesus' authority. And so what does Jesus ultimately use this authority for when you look at this life? What purpose does Jesus use this authority for? It's not for status or power and privilege. It's not to get more servants under him. It's not to really garner more, just more clout in a secular sort of worldly perspective. He uses this consummate, otherworldly, heavenly power. What does he use this for? Ultimately, he uses it for suffering and defeat upon the cross. 
Isn't that strange? All authority in heaven has been given to him. What does he use this authority for? Why does he cast out demons? Why does he teach in the synagogues? Why does he clear out the temple? He does all this because at the end of the day, he is using this authority to submit himself to the defeat of suffering the wrath for your sins upon the cross. Jesus' authority is to offer himself in defeat because in defeat is when he will get victory. It's in Jesus' authority in his defeat in which we have life in salvation. And if we look to this, if we understand this, it'll help us to reorient and re-gauge our perspective on life so that we wouldn't have such a hard problem with authority. Realize that life seems to go a little bit awry and frustrating and begin to crumble in when we try to assert our authority over Christ. See, the Christian life is never meant to necessarily be easy but it's meant to be edifying and right. He works differently. He uses authority. It's not easy for us to hear the fact that if you want to be first, you've got to be last. If you want to be the greatest, you've got to be the servant of all. If you want to gain your life, you've got to lose it. In other words, you've got to lose honor and prestige in this world, and maybe on the other side, Jesus will praise you and give honor in that world to come. No one wants to live by those paradigms. But the passage is calling us to live in this way. Why? Because Jesus is the one who is consummate and has complete authority over your lives. The one who is interfering and meddling in your lives because he knows that's what's better for you. Because he knows that's the only way that you will reach what God has called you to do in his son Jesus Christ, in which you will reach that joy and reach that satisfaction and that you will reach the purpose of your lives in the biggest picture, in the most fundamental way that you can ever imagine. Jesus Christ has authority over you. Submit all your decisions under him. Your use of time, your relationships, your money, all of that should be consumed and relegated under the authority of Jesus Christ because he has taken his authority and taken your sin upon him so that we may be brought into his family and redeemed by the very blood of his cross. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this passage. We thank you, Lord, that we are not left to our own to figure life out, that we are not left alone to make decisions, that we have the perfect, sinless Son of God who has united us to himself by his Spirit in his death and resurrection by a faith union in him. So, Lord, we pray that you would help us to submit all of our lives and let every thought and motive and action be captive by the gospel of Christ so that you may be glorified and that we may be edified and that we may enjoy this life as we worship you. So, Father, would you make this a truth and reality? Would you slowly work this into our hearts here this morning? We pray this in Jesus Christ.